Dr. John Jurek is an old friend. We work together on the now defunct Dr. Podcast Network, and today we're going to talk about non-clinical careers. He's a family physician who began doing non-clinical side jobs pretty early in his career. He started as a part-time physician advisor, a medical director, subsequently became a hospital CMO. He worked there for 14 years before leaving to partner in an urgent care startup in 2014, where he continues to serve as co-owner and medical director. In 2017, he started his podcast, which makes him one of the OGs of podcasting. His podcast is the Physician Non-Clinical Careers Show, where he presents interviews with physicians in unconventional careers and experts in physician career transition. And so that's what we talk about. We discuss the common myths about non-clinical jobs, some of the higher paying ones, some of the lesser known ones, and one that sounded so interesting that he applied for it himself. Now, we didn't mention it by name, um, but it's Verta Health, V-I-R-T-A. That's not a plug. We just want to share that information with you. He can be found at nonclinicalcareeracademy.com. So check him out. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. Dr. John Jerica, it's so great to see you. Thanks for being on the podcast. Hey, I'm I'm just happy to be here. It's uh, We've known each other for a while, but I've not been on your podcast, so I'm thrilled to be here and talk about some of the stuff that I've been up to. Yeah, long-time listener of your stuff and first time, uh, first time on the show, so this will be fun. This will be fun. So, yes. you know, your your expertise and your and what your own podcast is about is is non-clinical jobs. So, so let's start with just some common myths that you hear among practicing physicians about non-clinical jobs. Yeah. Well, and you know, I usually I'm talking with physicians who are either burned out or frustrated or just fed up or they're com- coming near retirement whatever, but they hesitate. They're always hesitating. They're always holding back. And it's because of these myths. Now, I want to distinguish the myths that I'm going to tell you about from self-limiting beliefs, because that's a whole other ball of wax. I I don't think physicians, for the most part, are held back too much by the self-limiting beliefs, like, you know, I'm not good enough or I'm going to fail, but somewhat. But I'm talking about just misconceptions. So let me give you the five. And then if you want to go deeper into any of them, then we'll do that. So these are the five that I've seen time and time again. Number one, and I'm going to speak as though I'm the physician. So number one, I don't think there are really that many jobs out there. Okay. That's false. Number two, I'm not really qualified to do anything except medicine. Number three is my income's going to crater. I'm, I can't afford to, you know, take a big pay cut. Uh, number four is, you know, I took an oath and I I'm abandoning my patients. I don't know if I can really do that as a professional. And then the fifth one is that, you know, my reputation is going to suffer. You know, um, I, I'm not going to be a doctor anymore if I go off on some tangent into some non-clinical job, not seeing patients. So those are the five, and they're all wrong. And we're we pretty much are done with the the podcast. So that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Um, well, so the the self limiting beliefs, right? Like I'm trained to be a doctor. I spent all of this time to cut suture. I'm really good at cutting suture now. And yeah, sometimes yeah. I can actually sew stuff up, right? Um, <laughs> <When you're lucky. laughs> exactly. So, um, but but there's all other arenas out there that we're not trained in. So it makes sense that you would think, you know what? I'm really good at seeing patients. That's what I've been doing. But these peripheral, peripherally related stuff that, you know, could use some of my expertise. I just, I just... I feel like a fish out of water there. So let's celebrate on that myth a little bit. Okay. So, I mean, it's logical. It's logical. And part of the logic comes from just ignorance because when you're in medical school and you're in residency and fellowship, they don't tell you about these things. And it's not really nefarious. It's just, there's no time to tell you about these things. You got enough to worry about to learn medicine and surgery and doing what you're doing that it's kind of invisible to you, even though you might be working in a big medical center or something, and there's actually people around doing those jobs. Um, But the thing is that these jobs require you to be a physician. So it is actually a natural next step. There's a whole industries out there that are just waiting to pull you in 
because they need you, your training, your experience, your wisdom to do this job. Nobody else can do it. So it's not really like taking a detour per se. I mean, and I have nothing against physicians who practice for 40 years and then retire, but in a way, the way I like to look at it is you're taking the next step up in your professional development. You're you're usually going to be doing something that involves leadership and you're going to take what you already know and add to it to take on this new role. And so that that's, and I give you examples of that. Obviously we'll probably talk about some of those, but that's really the way I look at it. And it's just, it's, it's the unknown because it's not something you really have time in your training to even think about. And who would want to go into med school thinking that the fourth job I'm going to have 20 years from now might be this eventual thing. We can't think that far ahead. It also makes me think, like when I graduated from college, I graduated in um, 2001. And so everyone went into either investment banking or consulting or law school or med school. Like that seems yeah. like the lion's share of what everyone went into. And the consultants were being paid by large corporations to come in and try and figure out how they can do things more efficiently. These mm-hmm. consultants were my classmates. They were 22. So if <laughs> yeah. they if they can have the audacity at that age to, to, to say, you know what? I think I can help you streamline the workflow of your uh, corporation here. Then, then we, as people who have spent our careers problem solving, right? Mm-hmm. For each individual patient, each individual personality, each individual medical problem. Yes, there's a lot of repetition of what we do, but you know, a lot of it gets told to the individual. So if we if we spend all this time and energy doing this, like I would hope that we're you know better equipped. And so we do have expertise more than we realize. And I think yes. a lot of you're bringing to the table more than just what you memorized in medical school and residency and what you did on your board exams. Right. Which gets us to myth number two is the fact that, well, I'm not qualified to do these things because I'm just a physician or I'm just doing medicine. But what is medicine? I mean, on one hand, you're a scientist. If you're in a party and you're talking to people, is there anybody else in the room that knows any more about biology, biochemistry, chemistry, even botany, pretty much any science you can think of? We have a background in it just as part of our overall education. And, you know, just talking to people, interviewing, presenting, interacting with patients, understanding the healthcare system itself. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And so I I like to tell a little, I like to do a thought experiment. So you're on a cruise ship, the ship is going down, everyone's getting put in these life rafts, you know, of course, there are life rafts now are like these self-enclosed modules, and you're going to end up on a desert island, and you get to pick the five people or the 10 people that are going to be in your lifeboat, and you know, you can have, well, you can have a f- teacher, a manager, you know, a policeman, blah, 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 you can pick everything. Who would be the top two that you would pick to go with you if you were using any common sense? A physician and an engineer. Period. End of story. Anything having to do with health, life, trying to not eat poisonous plants, what to do if you're injured, sick, you know, anaphylaxis. There's no one better to have around than a physician. And we have this background that covers so many things. So that's that's kind of how I address myth number two. I tend to think of those situations. The thing that differentiates physicians from non-physicians is like when you're on that desert island, and someone's having a, a serious medical problem, the physician knows enough to look around and go, yeah, there's nothing we can do. <laughs> Whereas everybody else is panicking and going, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? And we know with complete confidence, actually, there's, there's, we don't have anything at our disposal right now. There's, there's Yeah, <laughs> but there's two things that go into that, I think, too, that, that really always stand out in my mind. One is we're calm. I remember, you know, when I was a med school or a resident, I forget, and some kid was you know, having trouble breathing, they were, you know, whatever, they were aspirated or something. And the most calm anesthesiologist I ever saw in my life just walked in and said, don't worry, everything's going to be fine. Here's what we're going to do. And then five minutes later, everything was fine. So that's one is just just being calm. And the others were great decision makers. These are all just good qualities of any employee. So, I mean, we just have these certain attributes, these skills, character traits. I can go on and on. So we're going to bring you with us when we're going on those interviews. We're going to bring we're going to bring John with us. So um, I'd like this job, and he's going to tell you why I'm great at it. Okay, I'll do that <laughs> for a big fee. Yeah. And and that you mentioned abandoning our patients, right? Like yes, you know I think 
gosh, I was lucky that I got this spot in medical school. I was lucky that I got in, in, into residency. And if someone other than me would have gotten it, they would be doing X, Y, Z with this. I'd better make the most of it mm-hmm. and serve you know, my patients and my community because this other person was just as deserving and didn't get it. <laughs> Yeah, there's that. And then there's the fact that your parents always wanted a doctor for, a, you know, for a son and, you know, you owe society and you took an oath, blah, blah, blah. I mean, those things are all, you know, true. But the thing is, if you think about it, and I'll get back to a story. So I was a family physician grinding it out day after day, year after year. I mean, I was doing some things on the side. There were times when I actually hated my patients. It wasn't that I really hated them so much as I just hated my schedule and I had these whiners. And there's one skill I didn't have, which a good physician has to have, fire the patients you don't like. But anyway, I wasn't good at that. So I accumulated these over the years. And then some, I thought, okay, I'm going to switch over. I'm going to become a medical director and then a VPMA and then a chief medical officer of a hospital. I can tell you that I impacted so many more lives positively as the CMO for a hospital than I ever could as an individual physician take care of the minor trivia that I saw most of the time. Occasionally I'd catch some cancer or something, but really, I mean, we were doing root cause analysis for Sentinel events and we were avoiding never events. And we were, we were a top 100 hospital for like five of the last eight years. I was at the hospital. Mortality rates were down. Length of stay was down, which meant the care was safer. I was doing a lot better than I would have seeing patients. If you invent a new drug or bring a new drug to market, if you are, even as a utilization management, you could make the case for saying, you know, sometimes patients get the procedures and the tests they don't need, shouldn't have, and they're dangerous. And if they're not indicated, we shouldn't do them. Okay. You just save somebody's life. I mean, you can go on and on. You're in all these industries, you know, you're not just there to make a buck. You're actually helping downstream the patients probably more so than you did in your private practice. So is that, is that, is that four out of five? I think that's four out of five. Is that's there number one four. Uh, that three. There's there's a three was number three was the income. Ah, yes. Okay. So so that I mean now we're also you know keep in mind we're also talking to the higher income earners here, right? There's a pretty when you say income, like you're talking, oh, yeah. you know, a pretty wide range when you're talking about physicians. You might have ones that are making ten x what what others are making. So oh, absolutely. Um. Yeah. So, so I think you better it. think of a, a couple of ways you got to look at it. There. First of all, what are you getting paid hourly? So if you're working 70 hours a week and you got to count some of the call and you got to, and then we're not even counting the mental anguish. That, I mean, some of it's just part of being a physician. You know, you're making decisions that affect lives and that can be a stress, but the threat of being sued constantly. I mean, that has nothing to do with whether you're a good doctor or not. You're going to get sued pretty much depending on your specialty. Yep. We, we have a times. bunch of episodes where, where we <laughs> yeah. talk about that. Yeah. So now let's say, okay, comparing that to a nine to five job, five days a week, no call, no liability, all kinds of perks, you know, country club, blah, blah, blah. Um, and the pay, if you think of it, I don't know if the, if I would use the word teleologically, but anyway, if you think of it, if you're trying to recruit a physician to do something, And they have to be, let's say, an internist or an ER doctor. You're not going to be able to recruit them to do that unless you pay them a salary that's commensurate with their job as an internist. So, I mean, just looking at it from that standpoint, again, those people are going to be that are hiring you, you know, will say, well, there's a lot less stress, there's less time. So let's look at the hourly rate. But, you know, the average physician advisor, okay, this is any physician advisor. Remember, some physician advisors aren't licensed and have never gone to med school or never gone to residency. I mean, they're just, they got an MD, a a DO or an MBBS or equivalent. The average is, you know, according to salaries.com is like 140,000 a year. So there's a lot, you know, as the median. So obviously you get in at that level, if you are board certified and all that, you're going to be quickly up above 200,000 and so forth. But that's the physician advisor, which is like a part-time job. Um, And then most medical directors quote with that title, uh, their income is between 250 and 300. And if you look up chief medical officer, which by definition is hundred percent physicians, because there's no such thing as a non-physician chief medical officer. And that could be insurance company, hospital, uh, consulting firm, uh, I don't know, pharma where they have CMOs. And actually there's other places that use that term. So it's not the same thing, 
But if you look at the average, it's over four hundred thousand dollars for a nine to five job with six weeks vacation, et cetera, et cetera. So you compare that it's, and then what happens usually is you might be dropping a little bit because you're kind of going in that transition. You're the novice. Now you're starting over, so to speak in that, but over time you, you, you definitely go up quite a bit. And in any of these jobs, uh, plus you usually end up taking leadership roles because people always look at physicians at leaders. If they're unique. You know, in other words, if you're in pharma where you've got farm D's and this and that and the other, and you're the physician, a lot of times you become the leader of that team, even if you're not talking about clinical research. I think it's important to realize something that one of my partners once said to me is that, you know, there's the management and there's the labor. And as physicians, we're the labor. Right, right, right exactly. Right. We're not in management positions, right? We've got degrees and we're important and we're whatever big decision makers but we're the labor. We're not the management, right? And so when you switch roles and you go out of clinical practice, it sounds to me like you're going into, well, particularly it's CMO. Um, yes. But, you know, you're probably going to be in, in charge of some people. So you're going to be management and not labor. From So that's a, you know. It's interesting, interesting that you at. use that term because this is a, I'm going to digress for one minute here, but there used to be in the 50s and 60s, physicians were management and and provide and employees, so to speak. Okay. So now where we all are employed, you know, more than half and more than like, I think like two thirds go into some employed situation, even with a large group. Um, the ironic thing that I want to digress on is that in the state of Illinois and most other states, the reason you cannot unionize is because you're part of management. Yet show me a single physician who is actually part of management by virtue of being a physician. If they're employed, they're obviously not. a. So yeah. you can't unionize in Illinois as a physician, period. But anyway, you're right. It's a totally if you move into there, any of these non-clinical or non-traditional positions, you're going to end up being a manager or leader of some sort most of the time. So uh, that's that's a positive, I think. And then. That kind of goes into reputation, though, which is the last myth is that your reputation is going to be gone. And again, my story. So I was one of whatever, 100 family doctors on a small community hospital, you know, staff. I don't think there are 100 of us, but and other, you know, primary care doctors and so forth. I was like a little cog, you know, in, in the wheel as CMO. Like I was the head honcho, you know, I had much more <laughs> wherewithal, more say, more, let's say, gravitas and reputation and respect as a CMO or similar in other industries than I did as, like you said, an employee working and seeing patients every day. So I guess that's the point I wanted to make about that. And the, the ladies at my mother's Mahjong game already know that her son's a doctor. So that's not going to change if I'm doing clinical given. medicine, non-clinical. Yeah. Forever. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I've never, and I, everybody I know that goes into non-clinical is still called doctor by everybody around them. Um, so, so let's talk about other clinical jobs, right? You mentioned, you mentioned a couple already. Um, some of the less kind of intuitive, the more surprising non-clinical jobs that you've encountered in your in your podcast and your in your work well let's see the ones that's that were that seemed odd to me at first i'm I kind of used to all this now but um i saw someone that went and became a disability insurance broker um, but that was because she was disabled as a physician and she actually almost didn't get any benefit any disability benefits even though she had disability insurance and the reason was the policies make a big difference. You hear this from the financial people. They always say you have to have disability insurance. If you don't have a family, you don't need life insurance, but you need disability insurance from the day you have your MD degree and your residency and so forth, because that's the most valuable asset you have. Well, she found that out the hard way. She had to sue. She got compensated and she thought, you know, we don't know this crap as residents and physicians. And so that's what she does. She sells disability insurance to physicians and residents and she educates residents. Actually, she did a lot of that for free before she became a broker. So that, I found that one interesting. Um, I recently came across someone who was a healthcare navigator. Now, a navigator's term is used different ways, you know, like case manager, you know, they have navigators for HMOs and insurance companies and so forth. But she was someone who, and this is not a high paid job, but she it was something that was dear to her heart because of what happened with her, with a relative, her father, when he was ill and ended up dying. And she will answer questions and actually go to visits with 
patients have really complicated decisions to make about surgery or chemo or things like that. She's not an oncologist, but that's her consulting business. She will be the go-between. She will clarify. She will be the liaison. She will translate the language so the patient can make a decision. And that's what she does full-time now and teaches other people how to do that. Anything out there that's like super exciting? Like, uh, you know, you, you see all these TV shows where they're doing like, you know, resuscitating a patient and they're just completely wrong. So clearly they didn't consult a physician or they did. They just consulted well, yeah, like, yeah. That's true. So the, like the raw, like a, a pathologist or something who's, who doesn't see this stuff anymore. So, so, you know, what, how do you get into gigs like that? Other than well, like, wow, I went to high school with them. And so they asked me to do know, it. Yeah. They're, um, you know, anything anybody else does, it's weird and out there a physician does. I mean, I haven't, you know, interviewed all of them. But uh, one thing that I thought was an interesting job was president of the Psychedelic Medicine Association. You know, I don't know. She, she's a fellow podcaster. And uh, I don't know if you ever talked to Lynn Marie Morsky, but that was she an interesting was, position. I don't know. I think that was maybe episode 11 or something. I'm yes. on like, like 230 or something. But I think, yeah, Lynn Marie is, uh, she is an she is an interesting person and she's had a really interesting path. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yes. So I, I, but that one stands out in my mind and um, you know, uh, exciting stuff again, you know, there's people all over the country that are, you know, TV personalities and doing some, you know, online video thing or YouTube channel and that kind of thing. I, I found that the CMO for, a Medicare advantage, a Medicare administrative contractor, Mac, you've heard the word Mac, you know, they mm -hmm. keep all the money from us doctors and our yeah. mostly hospitals really. But that was a very interesting, I never had heard that you could get a job working for a Mac as a CMO. And so I found that interesting, but other than that, uh, nothing that interesting or exciting. It's, you know, <laughs> most of us do mundane things day in and day out. Actually the most happy patient, not patient, most happy people I've ever interviewed are uh, life insurance, medical directors and CMOs. They love their jobs. It's intellectually challenging and there's no call and they figure out the hard cases when the actuaries have finished what they can do. You know, you have someone with three or four different illnesses all coming together and I have to decide if they're going to insure them and for how much. And so then you have this medical director or CMO come in and try and sort through all that and help them figure it out. They love it. They never leave their jobs though. So it's hard to get that job. Wow. That's really interesting. They sound like they got to be gamblers. I don't, well, that they know great. statistics and epidemiology, yeah. whether they're gamblers, I don't know. That, that might be true. I never asked. So are you currently in a clinical job? I guess I am sort of in a clinical job. Uh, when I was, I left my CMO role in 2014 because someone enticed me, oddly enough, through LinkedIn, found me and asked me to be the medical director and partner in an urgent care center. And we had this long plan, five, 10 year plan, and we we're going to cash out after so many years. So I'm still doing that. I was actually working 15 shifts, 12 hour shifts a month for the first few years I was doing that. And now I, I barely set foot in a clinic. We have two clinics now, we're opening a third in. Uh, I don't know, two months. And I just supervise and collaborate with the PAs and the NPs at this point. So I'm just in a holding pattern there. I'm probably going to get someone to take my place as a medical director and phase out even further and do some other things like, you know, do a podcast weekly. <laughs> More podcasts. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's the answer to I'm everything. Uh, <laughs> yes. I think we should do a podcast just on esoteric jobs that physicians can do. Yeah. I think it'd be, I think it'd be really interesting. I think, that, that you know, was, that's where, where a lot of this, this burnout leads. It's like, ah, I just don't want to practice medicine anymore. Yeah. Um, I was actually in that place for a while. And the thing that really turned it around for me was one therapy and okay. two sleep. <laughs> now that my yeah. kids are sleeping better through the night, I'm just a less miserable human being. So, uh, that, oh yeah. What... Yeah. I can remember my therapy too. It was helpful, but it didn't have it didn't really have anything to do with burnout. It had to do with marital issues, but we won't go into that. <laughs> Podcast so, for another day, a different show. But it's common with physicians, obviously, you know, we're yeah, the worst. Yeah, yeah. Actually, we just covered, um, that. Uh, there was an episode uh, at this point, maybe it was the last, no, like two episodes ago where where that's what we talked about. Um, yep. So so um, have you come across in your interviews a non-clinical job where you were like, hey, 
I want to do that. I'm going to look for that and I'm going to apply for that. Like it was that exciting that it caught your attention and you're like, I want to do this job. Um, there was one that, that, that really comes to mind that I didn't pursue because of my advanced age. But if I had known about it earlier and understood it earlier, I would definitely do it. And that's be a medical expert, you know, re, you know, consultant, uh, just, uh, you know, uh, for litigation, you know, medical expert consulting business, because I liked it. I've been deposed, you know, in defense, in my own defense, luckily that I won those cases, but and I, I liked it. I mean, I didn't mind sitting there and being grilled by some idiot for an hour about some <laughs> medical topic, you know, cause they surely, they just didn't know what they were talking about. And so I, what I realized as I was doing the podcast and I was interviewing these medical experts, um, it was great because, you know, it's, there's nothing chart review and maybe a deposition you get paid two to three times what you get paid clinically for the most part, for most primaries, for sure. And some of the specialties. And so you could actually work less and make more money and have a better lifestyle, but you have to still be in practice, of course, for that type of consultation. But yeah, uh, yeah. in some States it's required. I don't think it's required in all States. So it depends on where you do it. Yeah. It's just, you can get, you know, the finger pointed at you in court. They if can you go impeach there. you. They can impeach you for yeah. not currently practicing medicine. Yeah. Um, there was something I came across recently that I actually applied for and I haven't heard back yet. And that's, uh, there's a company that hires physicians to be intake uh, personnel for uh, a new like remote treatment for diabetes, type two diabetes. I mean, it's not a treatment. It's a, you know, it's diet and coaching and the whole multimodality. And then they just need physicians to do the intake. So I applied for that a month or two ago just to see what it would be like. And they put me off till after the first of the year. So I'm still going to try. It's called Verta Health. So one of my one of my uh, members of a mastermind group that I run brought that up. And I thought, oh, I'd never heard of that. I think I'm going to look into that. So that was a little exciting to me, particularly as a side gig. Ah, the master learns from the apprentice. Yes. <laughs> so in, in all of your um, in all of your podcasts, you've got just you know, so much material out there. Would it so happen that you have any, say, <laughs> written material for our listeners? Maybe a, a list uh, uh, somewhere yes, of I non-traditional do. jobs for physicians? Yeah, you know, because the thing that I think gets the physicians, physicians get stuck is like thinking, okay, well, what are those jobs? Just give me this stupid list and I'll look them up myself. So I put together this list and it actually has a resource attached to it. It has like an association or a society attached to it, or maybe a course or something. So anyway, I have these 70, 70 discrete jobs or careers you can do then. So you can get it by going to my website slash the, the suffix. So it's at nonclinicalphysicians.com forward slash 70 jobs, seven zero jobs. And you put your email in and you get like almost well, two and a half, three pages of what the jobs are called. And then in a, some kind of a resource you could look at, like if you wanted to be an MSL, then you would have the MSL society to look at and blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, I mean, and you can just look at it and say, well, maybe this does open my eyes. There are a lot of options and some of these even actually look interesting. So that just helps people to kind of make that decision to move forward or not. And if I could mention something else, it's not a, it's not a, like a list or something. And it's not even something you can download. Uh, a friend of mine and I started something called New Script two or three years ago. It's like a Facebook alternative. So it's actually a community, but it's not just physicians. It's physicians, nurses, PAs, NPs, uh, dentists, anybody who's a clinician and is maybe burnt out, tired, frustrated, fed up. And it's about, you know, getting a better life, better careers. And so it's like, there's a small monthly fee. It's under $5 and it's just like being in Facebook, but it's anonymous. There's no ads. And we have a lot of free courses in there free once you pay the membership. So it's just at new script, N E W S C R I P T new script for your life, new script dot app. And you can look at, you get a seven day free trial and just look around at it. So that's maybe a useful resource for some of your listeners too. That's great. That's great. And if people want to, you know, find your podcast, they want to follow your follow you online. So, what's that website again? And what are your social media? No, the uh, like your website and your social media handles. Okay, so the website is nonclinicalphysicians.com. Okay, so everything's there, and you can get to the podcast and the show notes and and other things there. Um, I'm on. Well, I don't know. Twitter is kind of a garbage place, but I am on Twitter. <laughs> it has. 
and it has gone to hell recently with the <laughs> recent has. acquisition. It's yeah, yeah. So that's interesting. Wild. And it's a private company and all that. Uh, no, I'm on Facebook. It's just my name, John Jerica. Uh, there might be a number attached to it. Just look for John Jerica or not clinical physicians on Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, look for my name and uh, Instagram. I don't really put much there, but occasionally I Etsy, post. Etsy, uh, Pinterest, TikTok. Pinterest, no. no. <laughs> not, I'm too busy for that. No, I just have never gotten into it. I hear TikTok is really the place to be. My partner in New Script, he he goes on TikTok and does informational videos, and he's he's shocked sometimes. Every once in a while, one goes viral and it gets like two hundred thousand hits. But I'm not. I, I go and just yep. look around. Me neither. Me neither. I, I. It's too much. I think it's. Uh, I think it's inevitable <laughs> though. Ah, uh, uh. but. Dr. John Jerica, thanks so much for your time. It was great seeing you again and great talking to you. And this is uh, this is a long time coming, though. So thank you for. Uh, I really appreciate you having me on here. This has been fun. It's been great. So, best of luck in all you do. Keep up the good work with the podcast, Brad. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.